okay, lung cancer, things that you're going to need to want to know are basically you need to be able to diagnose lung cancer um, and recognize the perineoplastic syndromes. And I'll briefly show you kind of which ones you need to know for this test. And the other thing that we're going to spend, spend most of our time working on is the management of lung cancer. And I think that that's where a lot of us are going to have the most trouble answering questions because a lot of us from step one can, you know, diagnose lung cancer and we, we are familiar with the classic presentations. But again, how do we biopsy it? Who needs a biopsy? Who needs to have part of the lung removed? Those are the things that I really want you to take away from this so that you're more comfortable approaching this on the shelf. And big thing, you need to know this word for word. It's very likely to be in your test. We don't recommend lung screening for the general population, but for people who have greater than a 30 year smoking history, um, or if they quit uh, within the last 15 years after smoking for greater than 30 years, then we do screen them and make sure you know that they get CT scanning. We do not screen with a chest x-ray. So briefly, we'll cover the different uh, types of lung cancer and little things that might gain you some points in the exam. Um, if they ask you what the most common lung cancer is, then you should remember and know that, that adenocarcinoma is most common, and especially in non-smokers, it's most common, and in females. And you should know also that it comes up in the periphery of the lung, which as we'll talk about later is actually a more difficult place to sample. So a lot of times you're going to want to just do surgery on these people if you think they have a concerning mass on imaging. And the classic perineoplastic finding here is hypertrophic arthropathy. And this can be challenging to recognize on an exam. And I know I had a question recently where the patient had big uh, distal uh, joints in the finger, sounded like arthritis, and they also had this wrist pain, and it almost sounded like rheumatoid arthritis. The question tricked me into picking rheumatoid arthritis. So my point is that um, sort of know the general presentation of hypertrophic arthropathy. And somebody who has a new cough or concerning weight loss um, with signs in the hand and even risk involvement, then I would, especially if they're older age, definitely somebody that you'd want to, on the test, consider ordering a chest x-ray in. Don't just pick, you know, rheumatoid arthritis and start NSAIDs or, you know, steroids. And then with squamous cell, this is one that's associated with smoking as is small cell cancer. And... For squamous cell, be aware that it comes up in the central portion of the lung, close to where the bronchi start coming off. So this is the one that's going to more likely present with, with uh, hemoptysis or with obstruction of the bronchi. And as we'll talk about in a minute, it's the one associated with pancose tumors. And recognize that its associated perineoplastic syndrome is the increased calcium with parathyroid hormone release and protein elevation. But also, it likes to metastasize the bone. And if it does met to the bone, the patient's going to have increased calcium and increased alkaline phosphatase levels as well. So don't let that ever throw you off if you see increased alkaline calcium in a patient with a lung mass. It should be squamous cell. But if they have increased calcium and alkaline, that should make you think more so that they have a metastasis and you need to do a skeletal survey rather than that they have increased PTH-related protein. Because if they have increased PTH-related protein, they're going to have increased calcium with low endogenous parathyroid hormone, and they should not have increased alkaline phosphatase if it's PTR, uh, PTH releasing protein elevation. And then with small cell, this is the one with most of the perineoplastic syndromes. It helps me remember, and since this is a neuro-related histology, the perineoplastic syndromes have neuro-related consequences like the autoimmune attack of the cerebellum, but also if you think about um, SIADH, ADH comes from the brain, neuro, and cortisol from the adrenal gland, which is uh, not necessarily neuro tissue, but has the adrenal medulla, which to me seems neuro enough. So that helps me remember that if someone has Cushing syndrome, well, the lung mass is probably small cell uh, cancer. And then Lambert-Eaton syndrome, where they have muscle weakness that improves with increased activity. Um, beware, you see a classic Lambert-Eaton vignette. They may want you to tie the association with lung cancer and ask you to recognize that you should probably consider a chest x-ray or chest CT to further evaluate this patient for lung cancer. And again, with small cell cancer, we don't want to do surgery for somebody with small cell because it's so aggressive, it's probably already metastasized. And we'll talk about the workup a little bit more in a minute, but just know that small cell never has surgery. And for large cell carcinoma, pretty uncommon. I mean, really, you're, I've only had one question on this 
type of cancer, and it was on a QBank recently, um, not UWorld. Um, and the association I want you to make is that if they tell you that somebody has a lung mass, and then they tell you that this man has some gynecomastia, then what I think you should know is just be able to diagnose that, say, they're going to say, what's the most likely lung cancer in this patient? And you should be able to say, gynecomastia, lung mass, it's probably a large cell carcinoma. And I think that's all you need to know about large cell carcinoma in general. All right, and so how do these uh, cancers present? The classic one here, as, as I've written down for you, is a smoker with a new cough um, and maybe some weight loss. That's the big thing that you should nail down. That should make you think cancer until proven otherwise. Um, but also, it could be nuance at COPD. But as you know, we're going to do an x-ray either way. So just keep lung cancer in your mind whenever you have a presentation, smoker, new cough. And classic one is the superior vena cava syndrome. And what I wanted to point out to you is that, you know, in addition to the classic symptoms here um, and having you recognize that it's SVC syndrome, they may want you to know that small cell lung cancer is the tumor associated with superior vena cava syndrome. So maybe they just want you to know that association. Same thing with a pancos tumor. It's associated with squamous cell cancer. And know the classic presentation here with Horner syndrome, ptosis, meiosis, not sweating on the affected side, and they like to present this with shoulder pain um, and even a carpal tunnel-like syndrome. So, you know, a question like this where a patient has those two, those two things together, the radiculopathy and the um, Horner syndrome, I, I would be thinking squamous cell cancer until proven otherwise, and you're probably going to want to do a, a chest x-ray on them. And most common site of metastasis, and this is for all lung cancers together, is the liver, but small cell likes to go to the brain, and squamous cell, again, likes to go to the bone. And some more classic presentations, a post-obstructed pneumonia. Think of a squamous cell tumor that is proliferated so much that it's actually occluded an entire um, bronchial or bronchi. And that prevents clearance and it allows bacteria to stay in there and form a, an infection and a pneumonia. The other way this could present would be with um, an atelectasis, just because no air getting there, the obstruction causes the lung to collapse. And with small cell cancer, they like to give you the vignette describing somebody who's got the seizures and you know, maybe headaches, confusion, and it's pretty nonspecific. And somewhere in there, they're going to tell you that the patient has a low sodium level. And that's when you need to remember the association, low sodium level, SIADH, I need to go order a chest x-ray and make sure that this isn't small cell lung cancer. Then I already told you this, but watch out for Lambert-Eaton syndrome and its association. Now, a challenging thing with lung masses is, is when you have to deal with questions about the solitary pulmonary nodule, which is in an asymptomatic patient. That's key to remember, asymptomatic. If they're symptomatic, none of what we're about to, uh, about to talk about applies. They need a more thorough workup if they're symptomatic. But uh, it has to be a less than three centimeter nodule surrounded by normal tissue. And... The classic question is compared to a previous image, and again, if you have a new solitary pulmonary nodule and you have in the question it says one of the options is to compare to an x-ray two years ago, great, choose that. But more than likely, that's not going to be what they ask you to do. Um, somebody with a new solitary pulmonary nodule, whether they're low or high risk, they actually need chest CT. And this is something that I, when I was making this, struggled with, but on, on up to date, it's very clear that the recommendation currently, and I think on your shelf you would expect be expected to know that the workup for all pulmonary solitary pulmonary nodules is a chest CT, um, and then know the high risk factors if they give you the results, which would be irregular borders, which is, they like to also call spiculated, and if it's got some solid and some you know liquid or cystic components on the CT, that's another concerning finding, as are asymmetric versus. Um, symmetric calcifications or popcorn calcifications, which are a benign finding, as are a smooth border. And if it's completely solid, that would be reassuring as well. So no low risk versus high risk findings in the CT scan. And high risk patients, this is going to affect our workup on the next slide. The workup uh, long term for a solitary pulmonary nodule is different for a low risk patient who doesn't smoke and is younger versus someone who is 60 years old and smokes. Um, so again, if they're a low-risk patient, our management's going to be a lot more conservative. So we did our original CT scan, and what we're going to do is repeat a CT scan two years later. This is if they're low-risk, and 
in two years, if there's no growth, then we're done. They don't need to have that knowledge or follow it up any further. However, um, somebody who has those risk factors and or somebody who was low risk, but their CT had concerning features, uh, like we just talked about, these people are going to need biopsy. And we're going to talk more about how you biopsy, but just to run through it initially here, uh, if it's a peripheral solitary nodule, um, then this is challenging because um, there's not a really good way to get in there and biopsy a peripheral nodule. So most of these people, if they have high risk features or um, um, if the CT scan was high risk, then you really just need to do an excisional biopsy, which is surgery, probably a lobectomy, to completely remove that tumor and then to sample the lymph nodes. Um, but if it were a central lesion, and you know they probably have to tell you that if they want you to answer this, but more central lesions can be um, biopsied with a bronchoscopy. The idea being that that small tube can only get into bronchi of a certain size, and more centrally located masses are going to be easier to access with the bronchoscopy. Um, and then transthoracic biopsy is something you could do somebody with a peripheral mass who's really old and who may not be a surgical candidate. But again, a transthoracic biopsy is really hard to utilize and hard to test you on because if you do a transthoracic biopsy, there's a really high risk of creating a pneumothorax because you're going through the pleura. And additionally, the biopsy is of limited utility because a lot of times it can only get you um, a sort of an aspiration of cells for cytology. It's hard to even get a core you know, biopsy into the transthoracic position. So I don't expect them to test you on transthoracic biopsies. Then the next part of the workup is if we can confirm right off the bat that it's a small cell lung cancer, then we don't need to really do a more thorough workup from there because as we've already discussed, these people need chemo and radiation. And on the exam, they may give you sputum cytology. And I, I believe that sputum cytology, you know, is enough if there are small round blue cells to diagnose small cell cancer. Um, and then from there, um, I don't think you're going to be asked to, to, to make this decision uh, as far as screening or, you know, testing, staging from here. But um, classically, somebody may present with a headache. And if they have a headache, you should order a CT scan to see if there is a metastasis in the brain from the small cell lung cancer. That being said, you should not order a CT scan for somebody who is not having symptoms of a metastasis in the brain. Okay. Then let's talk about small cell lung cancer workup because it is a bit more complicated. So let's just start off here with a question. Let's say somebody has a suspicious mass and, and we think that it's, it sounds like a, a squamous cell or a non-small cell lung cancer. So what's the first step in the workup for uh, one of these cancers? Um, a full body, full body PET scan, that's, that can show us increased metabolic activity, may suggest metastasis outside of the lungs. On the exam, I really don't think you're going to be expected to know when or why to use a PET scan. And the current recommendations now are actually, uh, you use these very infrequently, usually for people with stage 2 cancer with some lymph node involvement in the lungs, and you're doing a PET scan to see if maybe there's involvement outside of the lungs. So I would not expect you to have to use a PET scan on the exam. And endo endobronchial and transthoracic biopsies. Now, this is something we may want to do. Um, these people are going to need a tissue diagnosis, but before you do a biopsy, and this is true for most cancers on the exam, before you do a biopsy, you need to do a CT scan because you need to stage it with imaging before you go in and do the biopsy. Because if we do the CT scan and there's the lung mass, great, but there's also a lymph node or the liver is involved, that's going to change where we want to biopsy. So you don't just go straight to biopsy after you found an imaging on the chest x-ray. Um, so now the point also is that you don't just do a chest CT, you involve the abdomen. So you, you know, chest and abdomen CT with contrast. That's how we stage it with imaging. And the point is that we want to see enlarged lymph nodes, not only on that side of the lung, but also in the mediastinum. And you need to look for liver and adrenal gland involvement, because again, that's going to change where we biopsy. Do it before the biopsy. I already told you that. So, and this is something that I'm really going to try and hammer in here is I think it's very testable is that... When you do the staging with imaging, if you find that in addition to their lung mass, they have enlarged lymph nodes, maybe a supraclavicular lymph node that's enlarged, or if they have a liver metastasis, we want to biopsy the site 
not necessarily the lung mass, we want to biopsy the site that has that will confirm the highest stage of disease. And for lung cancer, if you have a mass with lymph node involvement on the same side of the lung, that's a stage two. If you have lymph nodes involved on the other side of the lung, that's going to be oh, you know, stage three. And stage four would be if it involves the pleura or if it involves tissues outside of the lung. So, and, and how do we get our confirmed diagnosis? CT staging, again, does not confirm the diagnosis. The diagnosis must be confirmed with biopsies. Um, and sputum cytology, if someone has hemoptysis or sputum production, you could do it. I don't think that they're going to give you this is an option. Um, but if they did give you this is an option, I, I think that it's hairy here. I, I, I just don't think you're going to be expected to differentiate when to do sputum cytology versus when to do a more thorough tissue biopsy. So for central masses, again, you're going to want to do, you know, bronchoscopy, sticking a tube in into the trachea, into the bronchi. It's non well, it's invasive, but it's less invasive than cutting them open, doing a mediastinoscopy, which is a surgical procedure. And this could biopsy lymph nodes and masses that are, you know, inside or around the bronchi. And it can also get most of the mediastinal lymph nodes. And this is where I think it, it gets challenging for the medicine shelf is when do you recommend surgery and for somebody with a peripheral mass a peripheral mass and and you really can't do bronchoscopy to, to, to biopsy a peripheral mass so somebody with a likely adenocarcinoma based on imaging without lymph node enlargement the best answer is to do surgical removal which is also called excisional biopsy and then in addition to that, the question may say, should you or should you not biopsy the lymph nodes? And you should. You should definitely biopsy the lymph nodes. Because with cancer, the treatment we do, especially surgical, we want to be one step ahead. So if the imaging says that there are no enlarged lymph nodes, we still want to biopsy the lymph nodes with surgery or with our bronchoscopy to make sure that we're not missing something on imaging. On the contrast, if the Im uh, imaging suggested that there were enlarged lymph nodes on that same side, that's a case where you would do surgery in a lymph node dissection, which is where you go in and cut off literally every lymph node, send it to the frozen sections to see if it has cancer in it. And again, transthoracic core biopsies, I just don't think they're going to ask you to know when to do that versus doing surgery to remove a peripheral mass. On the test, I think if you did have to choose between a transthoracic needle biopsy versus surgery uh, uh, to remove a peripheral mass, I'd go with surgery. Okay, and uh, I'm just trying to really hammer in here. You have a, uh, a mass either central or peripheral, and there are lymph nodes that are enlarged either in the supraclavicular region or in the mediastinum. Uh, you want to biopsy lymph nodes over biopsying the actual mass because that can confirm a higher stage. And if the lymph nodes are involved on the opposite side uh, or the contralateral lung, that's where you'd want to biopsy because that would confirm stage 3 disease. Um, so let's do an example. You have a peripheral mass here, probably a adenocarcinoma, and they tell you that there's enlarged mediastinal lymph nodes on both sides of the chest. So what should we do here? Um, that sounds like stage 3. So we want to confirm stage 3 disease with our tissue biopsy. Should we take out the mass and then biopsy the lymph nodes? Probably not. Um, surgical excision with dissection. So this is a tricky question, and I put this on here because it is tricky. But in this case, the treatment for stage 3 lung cancer, which is what our imaging is suggesting here based on involvement of both sides, is actually to um, treat with chemo and radiation, at least initially. And the best answer here would be to do an endobronchial biopsy or bronchoscopy with biopsy and to biopsy the lymph nodes on both sides of the on both on both lung sides to confirm stage three disease. We don't want to do surgery right now because surgery is not the treatment of choice. Um, so this is a challenging thing. But again, biopsy the site that confirms the highest stage of disease. Okay. And then let's do the same patient, and now it looks like there's liver involvement. So we should biopsy the liver because that's going to confirm stage four disease. Now on the other hand. If you had somebody with the small mass in the periphery um, without enlarged lymph nodes, that's somebody who we're going to do a surgical 
you know, biopsy on where, or surgical excision, take out the mass, and then if there's no enlarged lymph nodes on imaging, we still want to sample the ipsilateral lung and mediastinal lymph nodes during our surgery to make sure that we're not missing something. Because if you found lymph node involvement during the surgery, that's okay. That just means that person's going to need, you know, adjuvant radiation therapy. All right. And same idea here, but now let's say you have a three centimeter peripheral mass, but you also have some lymph node involvement on the same side of the lung. That's a stage two lung cancer. And for stage two lung cancer, you still want to do um, surgical removal of the mass. But in this case, instead of sampling those lymph nodes, you're going to actually do a lymph node dissection, which is a much more thorough, longer surgery.